1101. Um, we are, I think we've got the bulk of our audience uh, with us this morning. A very warm welcome to you all. Great to see a few familiar faces and some new as well. Um, welcome to the latest webinar from the Centre for Armed Leadership. My name is Lieutenant Colonel Langsharp, S1 Leadership here at the Cal. Um, today, it is our privilege to be joined by Mr. Jeff McDonald, who you can see on screen, who's going to be talking about well-being, um, particularly looking at the stigma of mental health and, uh, and self-care. And more on Jeff in, in a minute. Um, for those of you that have joined us previously, you'll be probably used to a different format. Today, it's more of a Zoom meeting, which means we can see and hopefully at, at some point hear you all. Um, after my short introduction, I'm going to hand it over to Jeff, who's going to talk for about 40 minutes on self-care. We're then going to break you down into breakout rooms for an opportunity for you to discuss and to reflect what Jeff has spoken about. About 15 minutes, then close back into the main room for a 10-minute uh, open discussion. Really welcome your participation and feedback there. We then hand back over to Jeff for 15 minutes talking about mental health and stigma and mental health before I uh, talk things to a close around about uh, 12 30. Um, so why why this subject and, and, and why now? Um, it's critical to, to the way we do business, it's critical us as people, we're a people organization um, and it sits really as an integral part of our doctrine. For those of you that know the army leadership doctrine you'll be aware that we talk about a framework which looks at what people, what leaders are, what leaders know and what leaders do. When we talk about what leaders do, we talk about task, team, and individual. And we're often very focused on the task, taking action. We're pretty focused and pretty good at delivering high performance teams. And we do well at looking after each other, service in the service of others, servant leadership, looking out for each other. But I think sometimes what we forget is ourselves, the self, the individual leader. And when you break it down, leadership has got to start with the individual leader. Because if you're not psychologically and mentally fit, and you focus a lot on physical fitness, if you don't have psychological and mental fitness, then ultimately it's going to affect your leadership and the way you support others, build teams, and indeed achieve the task. So absolutely critical. And why now? I think we all know that, that um, everyone needs to focus on self-care, but it's a pretty, pretty uh, key issue within the military, given the the particular and sometimes unique challenges we face in, in the army, both on operations, but also back in barracks, trying to get a delicate balance between home life and, and work life as well. Particularly pertinent now, and it's a, it's a sort of national conversation given the unique demands that uh, the current crisis has placed on us all. It's a really pertinent subject, and it's great that, um, that Jeff has been able to, to join us today. So a little bit more on, on uh, Mr. Jeff McDonald then. I've heard Jeff speak before and he's, and he's fantastic. So I'm really, really enthused that he's, he's joined us today. Jeff is a uh, consultant, a fellowship consultant with the Forward Institute. And thanks to the Forward Institute for helping us uh, host this meeting today. Uh, they are a not, not-for-profit organization promoting responsible leadership. So thank you to them. Um, Jeff's resume is pretty impressive. Spent 25 years with Unilever. For those of you, I don't think there's anyone in the audience who's never heard of Unilever, a global organization. Today employs over 150,000 people. 2.5 billion people per day use their products and their products are sold in, a, in over 190 countries, so pretty much every country in the world. And Jeff sat for many years at the heart of that organization as vice, uh, a global vice president for HR, driving organizational change through global leadership and talent development. He's now a highly respected and very influential campaigner for um, breaking the stigma of mental health and driving purpose into the heart of our organizations and indeed the heart of individuals. And you'll, you'll, you'll get that sense of passion uh, when, um, when you hear uh, Jeff talks. And I talk about how influential he is. He mixes uh, at the highest echelons of, of, of governments, global leaders, royalty et al. Um, he set up Minds at Work, a co-founder of Minds at Work, and, uh, and has numerous appointments as a strategic advisor, patron, and trustee. Enough for me. Um, I'm going to hand over now to Jeff McDonald. As we go into that transition, I'm going to ask Marie if um, you could put a, a quick poll up, please, and ask you all to participate. And I believe it's how well are you feeling today on a scale of one to 10? How much energy have you got today? 
And you should all see that on your screens if you could enter that poll, please. And without further ado, I hand over to Jeff. Jeff, a warm welcome. Wonderful, thank you, Langley. Um, and I'm just gonna give people a, a, a few minutes to, um, to complete the poll. Mari, are you going to be able to give us a? Um, are you going to be able to give us the results of the poll? Um, <clears throat> sure, but nobody has voted yet. Okay. <laughs> I have. You have. Yeah. I have. Might need to refresh it, maybe. And me. Can you see anything? Ah, there we go. Yeah, yeah. yeah. getting some results coming through. Very good, yeah. It's looking rather positive. Okay, all right. Thank you, Mari, and uh, thank you to everybody for just uh, sharing that. Langley, thanks for that introduction. Um, it, so, it sounded far too impressive um, because I'm just, uh, I'm just an ordinary guy who lives uh, down in Surrey uh, and yes, worked for Unilever for 25 years. And then I think it was, um, I think it was Mark Twain who once said, uh, the two most important days in your life, what are they? And often when I ask that question of audiences that I talk to and engage with around the world, I always throw the question out to the audience and say to them, so Mark Twain said the two most important days in our life, what are they? And, and I would say 98% of the response that I get is that the two most important days in their life is that the day, the day they were born and the day they die. And I often wonder, I often wonder, what is it about the human species that we are so pessimistic that we can't wait for the second most important day in our life, which is the day that we die. And of course, Mark Twain didn't say that the two most important days in our life is the day we were born and the day we die. He said that the two most important days in our life is the day we were born and the day we find out why we were born. That sense of purpose that sense of meaning. And I really believe that everybody and everybody on this call today, all of us have kind of got a unique gift, a unique gift that once we've uncovered it, we can bring it to the world to make it a better place. But it is about reflecting on that big question. Why was I born? And I became really clear on this concept of the why a couple of years ago. And my why is very, very simple. Since Unilever, and in fact, it started in about 2012, wow. my why is about trying to create workplaces all over the world. And you know, people often associate me with a big corporate. Well, guess what? A workplace. The army is a workplace. The navy is a workplace. The NHS is a workplace. A university is a workplace. A school is a workplace. But I want us to have workplaces all over the world where people in those workplaces feel that they genuinely, genuinely have the choice to put their hand up and to ask for some help if they are suffering from a common form of mental ill health. If you think about it, we have workplaces all over the world where people in those workplaces today are suffering in silence. They don't think that they genuinely, genuinely have the choice to put their hand up and ask for some help if they are suffering from a common form of mental ill health, depression, anxiety, bipolar. 
And it always strikes me, I always think to myself, you know, we're living in the 21st century. You know, we're living in the century where we've put men and women on the moon and we brought them back safely. We talk about artificial intelligence that we have. Elon Musk the other day put some astronauts commercially into space. So in the 21st century, in an environment, probably a working environment, where our mental health, our cognitive abilities, our cognitive abilities, our mental health, our ability to read a document and remember it, our ability to look at some data and analyze it, our ability to make a good judgment. In the 21st century, where a lot of our work is based on a knowledge economy, is based on how in how, how good we are mentally. In the 21st century, we still have workplaces all over the world. Not only workplace, we have families. We have friendship groups where people in those friendship groups or in those families don't think that they can talk about their mental ill health. They feel embarrassed. They feel ashamed. And you know what? We're all mental. There's not one person on this call today who is not mental. We are all mental. We're all emotional and we're all physical. And yes, we can talk about our physical health. And that's why that sense of purpose that I talk about, this whole sense of, of trying to create these workplaces where people feel comfortable. I don't think it's a very lofty purpose. I'll tell you why I don't think it's very lofty. Because in every workplace, everywhere in the world, everywhere in the world, people feel comfortable to put their hand up and ask for some help if they are suffering from a common physical illness. Flu, glandular fever, irritable bowel syndrome. You'll put your hand up at work and say, look, I'm not feeling well, I need to go home, I've got to get better. But if you were struggling mentally, ooh, Oh, no, no, I'm not sure if I can put my hand up. Don't know what that might do to my career. I don't know that what, my, what, my, what people might think of me. They'll think I'm weak. I can't take the heat in the kitchen. In the 21st century. And you might say, Jeff, why are you so passionate about trying to create those sort of workplaces all over the world? And the reason I'm so passionate about it is is because I've got, a, I've got a story and I'm gonna share some of that story with you today. And I want you to reflect back January 25th, 2008. And the reason I never ever forget the date is because the 26th of Jan, 2008, my eldest daughter was going to turn 13. So you can imagine how much excitement there was in our household on the evening of the 25th of Jan. Why? Because this young girl at midnight on the 25th of Jan, she was gonna go through a rite of passage. And she was gonna become a teenager. And I'm sure there's nobody on the Zoom call today who can't resonate with that feeling. Remember the day and for some of us, it's probably a long, long time ago. But I can remember that day so clearly, the day before I was going to be a teenager, how excited I was. And I remember Jen saying to me, she said, Dad, you know, tomorrow you start talking to me differently. I said, what do you mean I'm going to talk to you differently tomorrow? And she said, yes, you are, Dad, because I'm no longer going to be your little girl. I will be a teenager tomorrow. And you start treating me as a teenager. And at midnight on the 25th of Jan, I get woken up. And I get woken up with the most massive, massive panic attack. Now, up until that point, I don't think I had even, I don't think I had ever used the words panic attack as part of my vocabulary. I don't think I had ever had a conversation 
with anybody about a panic attack. It just wasn't part of my vocabulary. I had never come across somebody who had had a panic attack or nobody had ever shared that with me. And I get woken up and the ends of my fingers are tingling, the ends of my toes are tingling. My heart is beating. I've got these palpitations, I'm struggling to breathe. I'm sweating profusely. I mean, I remember the bed sheets, they were wet, wet, wet because I mean sweating profusely. And because I was so ignorant to a panic attack, I thought I was about to have a heart attack. And I remember bumping my wife and saying to Debbie, Deb, I think I'm gonna have a heart attack. And she, she said, why? And I tried to explain what was going on. And she said, well, why don't you get up and just walk around the room and take some deep breaths? So I get up, I walk around the room, I take some deep, deep breaths. And you know, every time I tell the story, every time I tell the story, I feel some of that anxiety. And so I always, I just stop to take a deep breath. And as I took these deep breaths, so the levels of anxiety just began to subside a little, got myself back into bed, but I can't go back to sleep. And I can't go back to sleep because one, the adrenaline is pumping through my body. Two, I'm petrified that if I fall back to sleep, it might happen again. And I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy. And the third reason, and I don't know where it came from, but I developed this capability to catastrophize over the most insignificant issues in my life. I remember getting up at about three in the morning and I went into the bathroom. I remember I had a sore on the inside of my mouth. And I remember I interrogated the sore, looking in the mirror, interrogating the sore, getting back into bed and convincing myself that I had the beginnings of throat and mouth cancer. Convinced from this little sore on the inside of my mouth. I was convinced. And so I lie there in bed, petrified that if I fall asleep, it's gonna happen again. I'm catastrophizing about the fact that I've now got cancer and I'm full of adrenaline. And so I can't go back to sleep. Who comes running into our bedroom at seven in the morning? Jennifer, why? It's her birthday. And we have a tradition at home where we, on birthdays, we put all the presents at the end of the bed and everyone jumps onto the bed and we open presents together and her little sister, Anna, comes running after her and is opening the presents. And all I can say to Jennifer and to Anna and to their mum, Deb, is please, please go away. Please, please go away. I, I can't engage in anything that is joyful, that is happy, that has got excitement attached to it. And this is my daughter's 13th birthday. And so I asked them to please just leave me and go downstairs, open their presents, which they do. The girls go to school. Debbie gets back at about 10 o'clock. Where am I? Still in bed. Debbie says, what's wrong? What, I mean, what, what is wrong? And I said, I don't know. I said, I just, I, I, I feel paralyzed. I, I, I can't. I can't even swing my legs onto the side of the bed, onto the floor and get up. I just feel, I just feel this anxiety. I feel paralyzed by this anxiety. And she said, Jeff, but that's not like you. I said, I know. She said, she said, will you go and see a doctor? I said, what? I mean, what a doctor? Why? I've got no aches. I've got no pains. I'm not feeling nauseous. I've got no temperature. There's no reason for me to go and see a doctor. She said, but this is just not like you. Really, please, please, will you go and see somebody? Lunchtime that day, I'm in the doctor's rooms. And he begins to ask me a set of questions around my sleep patterns, my motivation, my diet, my loss of weight or my increase in weight, what I can't read, what I can read. He asked me, have you had any suicidal thoughts? And I said to him, yes, I have. He said, have you planned it? I said, no, I haven't. And at this stage, my levels of irritability are going through the roof. 
I'm feeling so irritated that he's asking me these questions. He hasn't taken his stethoscope and listened to my chest. He hasn't listened, you know, taken my blood pressure. He hasn't looked into my eyes. He hasn't looked into my ears. And I sort of say, what are these questions about, doctor? And he said, Jeff, you're ill. I said, what do you mean I'm ill? Ill with what? You've done no diagnosis. You've asked me a few questions. He said, Jeff, you're suffering from anxiety-fueled depression. Me? Depression? Do you know what my understanding of the word depression was up until that point? Midday, 26th of Jan, 2008, my daughter's 13th birthday. You know what my understanding of the word depression was? I know we've got a, over 40 people on this call. Maybe one of you is an Arsenal supporter, because I'm one. And there we go again, last night. I was so excited. I thought we were going to beat Leicester. And then in the last 10 minutes, typical Arsenal, you know, let them score a goal. And you know, most of the season is like that. You get two thirds into the season, you think you're going to win something. And then guess what? The last third, the wheels fall off completely. And I would turn to Debbie, my wife, and say, you know what? I'm so depressed. And she'd say, why? I'd say, because of this Arsenal football team. I'm a South African. Unilever moved me to the UK in 98. And when I got here, um, I'd been here for about two years. And around January time, people used to talk to me about a thing called SAD. And then I'd say, SAD, what's that? And they'd say, no, it's seasonal effects disorder. I said, what? What is that? And they'd say, no, it's the weather. It can influence your mood. I used to think, what? The weather? Influence your mood? Why don't you just man up, you snowflake? As Piers Morgan would probably say. That was my understanding. I mean, I'm a keen mountain biker. I love to go for a mountain bike. I live, I'm so fortunate. I live in the Surrey Hills. And it would rain on a Saturday morning and I'd turn to my wife and say, I'm depressed because it's, because it's raining outside. I'm depressed because it's raining outside. I can't go for a bike ride. I mean, that was my understanding of this word or this concept of depression. And here I am on the 26th of Jan, 2008, diagnosed with anxiety-fueled depression. As I leave the doctor's rooms that day, I make a decision that saves my life. And as I walk out the doctor's rooms, I make the decision. And the decision that I made, and you know, in many ways, the, the doctor who diagnosed me, he liberated me to make this decision. And the decision was, I would not be burdened by the stigma that is associated with the illness. And because of that decision, I went home and I told my girls and my wife. I told some of my close friends. Sorry, that shouldn't have happened. I told some of my close friends. And I told my employer. You know, I was really lucky. Because at the time, yes, I was 20 years into Unilever. I would built quite a lot of credibility as an individual. I had a boss at the time who had a compassionate and understanding relationship to mental ill health. Wow, I was lucky. I had somebody who understood this, was compassionate about it. I had other colleagues who had a good understanding and were compassionate. And the reason that that decision saved my life is because it took me three months to get better. I couldn't go to work. There's no ways I could go to work. And I would spend days, weeks, and months at home trying to get better through a combination of cognitive behavioral therapy, medication, slowly getting back onto my bicycle, getting into the swimming pool. But the only thing that kept me alive during my darkest moments, because in those three months, I had very dark days, I had days where I felt I was such a burden to so many people. 
I had days when I thought it would probably be better for all of those people if I wasn't alive. And during those dark, dark moments, the only thing that kept me going as a result of my ability to talk and share my illness, the only thing that kept me going was knowing how much I was loved. Loved. How many songs have been sung about the power of love? How often do we talk about love in workplaces? But you know, feeling loved, feeling loved in my darkest moments kept me alive. And there was one other intangible that kept me going was every 10 days I used to meet with a friend of mine who two years prior had been admitted to the Priory. He was so ill. And I used to meet with Martin and I saw he was better. What did it give me? Hope. He gave me hope that I could get through this. He'd been so ill, he'd been admitted to the Priory and now he was better. And I used to meet with Martin and I just got such a sense of hope, such a sense of hope that this would pass. And so through love, feeling loved, and that sense of hope, together with the, those other more medical interventions, I do recover. It takes me three months. I slowly reintegrate myself back into Unilever in 2008, around about May. And it's a slow reintegration into the business. It's a little bit like if you'd broken your leg and you went back to work, people wouldn't ask you to go and make them a coffee. And so my integration had to be slow. So I slowly reintegrate myself back in. 2010, I have a bit of a relapse, nothing as bad as 2008. And then in 2012, I was doing a global role looking after all of our marketing, communications and sustainability around the Unilever world. And um, I left the head office in Blackfriars and I was walking over Blackfriars Bridge towards Waterloo Station. Because that's where I get my train down to a little village called East Horsley where I live. And as I'm on the bridge, my phone goes. And on the end of the phone is my wife. And she said, Jeff, where are you? And I said, um, on Blackfriars Bridge and I'm on my way home. She said, you've got to get home quickly. I said, why? She said, I've got terrible news. You can imagine the first question. Are the girls okay? She said, yes, the girls are fine. But one of your closest friends died by suicide this afternoon. I said, what do you mean, Deb? He died. He's dead. We saw him a couple of weeks ago. He was full of beans. There's a lovely saying, the brighter the light, the darker the shadow. The brighter the light, the darker the shadow. Ruby Wax, Stephen Fry, Robin Williams, Vici, Winston Churchill. The brighter the light, the darker the shadow. And you know, that summed up my friend. He brought so much energy. He brought so much passion and compassion to the world. If you ever went to a party, he would be the kind of almost the center of attraction. You know, those people who just bring energy to places. That was him. And now he was gone. And I got home. I got into bed that evening and I lay there. And you know, I'm not a psychologist. I'm not a therapist. I'm none of that. I'm not an expert in mental health. I'm just somebody with some lived experience. But I lay in bed and I thought to myself, here I am in 2012. Here I am in 2012 now, four years after my crucible moment in life, in many ways flourishing, in many ways 
learning how to recover every single day and maintain my recovery as somebody susceptible to anxiety fueled depression and my friend is gone what's the difference and there were two things that i thought about the one was when i was ill i was able to talk he wasn't think about an alpha male africana south african and if you don't know what they look like think about the south african rugby team and you get a sense of what that lot looked like there is no ways he could have this conversation not at home not with a close friend like me and not no ways in the company that he was in at the time there's no ways he could have that conversation so that was the first conclusion the difference was i was able to have one conversation he was unable to talk about his feelings and the second conclusion that i came to that evening as a result of that thought or that insight was that stigma had just killed my friend stigma stigma had just killed my friend because had he had a physical illness what would he have done put his hand up and asked for some help and i just thought to myself that can't be fair that can't be fair and so i thought i've got to do something about this and i didn't know where to start because you know i'm a south african living down in surrey my friends are a bunch of south africans i'm doing a global job in unilever i haven't really got much of a network in the uk how where am i going to start how am i going to make a difference about addressing the stigma of mental ill health in workplaces but that night i remember back in 2012 this was october of 2012 in about 2008 2009 here in the UK, we began a campaign called Time to Change, which was all about trying to get people to talk more about their, their mental health, mental ill health, Time to Change. And back then in 2012, the sort of front of that campaign, one of the individuals that were fronting that campaign was a guy called Alistair Campbell. And so I went onto his website and I found an email address on his website and I wrote to him that night jeff.mcdonald at btinternet.com not alistair not tony blair writing to alistair campbell just some arbitrary living in surrey and i told him what had happened to me in 2008 and 2010 and that i just lost my friend this afternoon to suicide please please would he meet with me because i knew if i could just meet with him because of he was quite high profile he knew lots of people in this space he would introduce me and open some doors. Within 10 minutes, I have a response from him. Within 10 minutes, from some ARB who sent him an email, I get this response. A week later, we meet up in Belsize Park, close to where he lives, in November of 2012. And ever since that day, ever since that day and that meeting, he begins to open some doors, introduce me to some people, which leads me to take tiny, tiny footsteps on a journey filled with a deep, deep sense of purpose. And that is to create workplaces all over the world where people in those workplaces, everybody feels that they genuinely, genuinely have the choice to just put their hand up and to ask for some help if they're struggling from a common form of mental ill health. And you know, I'm not saying to all of you today, I'm not saying to all of you that had my friend been able to talk, that he would definitely still be here today. I'm not saying that for one minute. But what I am saying, see the gap between my fingers? It's tiny. What I am saying is had he been able to talk, there's a tiny, tiny chance that he would still be alive. Tiny. And you know, that's worth fighting for every single day of my life. It is worth fighting for. It is worth fighting for giving people 
all around the world who are suffering in silence. It's worth fighting for, giving them the opportunity to put their hand up and ask for some help. So that's why I'm so passionate about trying to create these kind of workplaces all over the world. And one of the things that Langley asked me to share with you today is what have been some of the learnings out of that experience of mine? But more importantly, what have been some of the learnings as I've traveled this journey over the last six years? So in 2013 and 2014, I led a piece of work in Unilever. I co-led a piece of work in Unilever around breaking stigma. And at the end of 2014, I left Unilever to take those learnings out into the world. And I want to share with you probably the most profound learning for me as a result of my crucible moment in life. And that learning continues to be reinforced as I go to people and places that I could never ever have imagined. Do you know a sense of purpose takes you to people and to places you could never ever imagine? Never. Langley gave me such wonderful introduction about all these highfalutin people that I've met and worked with. Well, you know what? It's been driven by a sense of purpose. It's taken me to people and places I could never have imagined. And as I've traveled and worked in different sectors and helped organizations address the stigma, the, the most limiting resource that I see in organizations today, irrespective of the sector it's in, whether it's in the financial sector, in law firms, in the armed services, in the NHS, in media, the most limiting resource that I see in workplaces today is the energy of people. People are frazzled. They are frazzled. They cannot wait for a Friday afternoon. And they detest a Monday morning. There was a book written, The 10 Most Enjoyable Walks in the World. And when the publishers did the research and went out and asked people, what, is, what has been your most enjoyable walk in the world? Not that it was published, but what do you think people said was one of their most enjoyable walks in the world? And I'll tell you what it was, and it was in the top 10, was leaving the office on a Friday afternoon, walking to the station, to the car park, or home. One of the most enjoyable walks in the world. And I don't have to ask you what's one of the least enjoyable walks in the world. Walking to the office on a Monday morning. And so one of the insights for me is that, you know, energy, energy. And people feeling frazzled. I mean, we've created workplaces where we suck every bit of energy out of people. And I would argue that energy is probably the most important driver of individual team and organization performance. I would argue that the energy of your people, for those of you in HR, or those of you that sprout that people are your most important asset, I would challenge you. It's not people are your most important asset. It's the energy of your people. The energy, the health of your people is your most important asset. And the analogy or the metaphor that I often use to kind of prove my point about how, how important energy is as a driver of individual team and organizational performance, and I use it particularly with UK audiences, is that there's a football club out there called Liverpool. I don't know, Charlotte, I see you love them. Well, I can tell you, Charlotte, I don't know where you guys have come from. All right? I just don't know where you've come from. 
I mean, here you are winning the bloody Champions League. You've won the league this year. I mean, it's taken you 30 years to do so. But you know what you did? Two years ago, you parachuted, or three years ago, you parachuted a guy into the club. And his name's called Klopp. And what has he brought to that club? He has brought energy. He's brought passion. And look how they are performing. And so for me, one of the really big insights has been this concept around energy and the importance of us maintaining our energy, our health. We get our energy from looking after our health or what we sometimes call our well-being. And you know that crucible moment in my life in 20, 2008? That crucible moment taught me that the most important priority in my life is my health. There is nothing more important than me maintaining my health. Nothing. Because when I'm not healthy, I've got no energy. And when I've got no energy, I can't perform. And it's weird how COVID-19 has played into that narrative for me. COVID-19 has played into the narrative when individuals are not healthy, driven by a pandemic, look what happens to the world. Look what happens to economies around the world. People with underlying health conditions have been susceptible to the tragedy of COVID-19. Yet, and I think it was the air, I think it was an air hostess who once brought this to life for me. And she said, if this airplane goes down during the safety briefing and the oxygen mask falls and your daughter is sitting next to you, who do you put the oxygen mask on first? And she said, you put it on yourself first and then your daughter. How often do you put that oxygen mask on yourself? Or is your life about putting oxygen masks on everybody else? And then you wonder why you might get and be susceptible to illnesses, why you get stressed, why you're irritated. And what do we mean by our health, our self-care, our self-compassion? I'm just gonna share with you a little framework. I hope I can share it now. I'm gonna share with you a little framework around health and well-being. Hope you can all see that. And essentially, this framework has come from Warwick Edinburgh, some research that has been done by Warwick Edinburgh University. And the framework around our health, our health is driven by four elements. There is our physical health, and we maintain good physical health by sleeping well, by being active, by eating and drinking well, and one thing that I could never do, called recovery. I couldn't spell the word recovery. But you know what, when I go for a mountain bike ride and it's in the, in, the, in the winter and I come back with a muddy bicycle, what's the first thing I do to my bike when I get home? Is I let it recover. I clean it, I oil it, and it can recover. How often do you take moments out during the course of the day to just recover? every two hours, a 10 minute recovery break or a five minute recovery break where you do nothing. You don't have your mobile phone with you. You just go and stand in the daylight, look outside, listen to the birds, look at the sky, go for a coffee on your own. In the old days, I used to say to people, go and have a coffee, five minutes, 10 minutes. I remember, I, 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 
people used to say to me, you know, if I walk into a coffee shop and I see somebody sitting in a coffee shop with a cup of coffee on their own, not on a tablet or a screen, I think they're weird. There must be something wrong with them. If they're just sitting there having a coffee. And so recovery, recovery has become such an important driver of my physical health. But I was always taught about, main, you, know, the, you know, physical health and how you maintain physical health. I was never taught about the importance of emotional health. And what do I mean by emotional health? What I mean by emotional health are your feelings, how you feel. And we've got like, apparently we've got close to 300 emotions, contentment, sadness, fear, anger. Those are, that's your emotional health. And the two biggest drivers of our emotional health, the two biggest drivers are relationships and our financial security. You know what it's like when you love somebody and then you have a fight with them. You know what that does to how you feel when that relationship is broken down. Or there's somebody at work that you really respect and you get on with and then you fall out or you have a terrible argument or you disagree about something and you go home just feeling, oh. So relationships is a key driver of our emotional health. And the other driver of our emotional health is our financial security. And then we have our mental health. And people always say to me, what's the difference between emotional health and mental health? Well, our mental health, as I started this session, our mental health is our cognitive ability. So it's our ability to concentrate, to focus, to read a document and remember what we've read, to look at some data and analyze it, to make a good judgment, to make a good decision. It's our cognitive ability. And when we are emotionally stressed, we struggle with our cognitive abilities. I'll give you an example. The other day I put diesel in a petrol car. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not a mechanic, all right? And guess what? Because I'm not a mechanic and I know nothing about how cars work, because I put diesel in a petrol car, I kind of thought, shit, that's the engine gone. And then somebody said to me, no, just phone the AA. They'll come and they'll drain your engine and then you can stick your petrol or diesel in. Now, when I, tried, when I, got, the, when I got the AA card out of my cubbyhole or the glove box, I was so anxious, I couldn't read the number on the card. Can you see how my emotional health, being so anxious, influenced my mental health? Think about times when you feel really anxious, you're feeling really stressed, and you're trying to read a document and you can't read, you have to go back and read it again and again. So that's our mental health. And we often maintain good mental health by, by, by being curious, by learning a new skill, by taking time out to do a bit of meditation and mindfulness. Those are some of the things that we can do to maintain good mental health. And then finally, right at the top of the triangle, Ed, Ed, Warwick Edinburgh talk about spiritual health. Now, I don't talk about spiritual health when I go into workplaces because the CEO then thinks I'm coming to convert them to some faith. But what I do talk about is about having a sense of purpose, a sense of meaning. And so this, this little triangle, this definition of health and well-being, this has become my Bible. This is the most important priority in my life, is maintaining all elements of my health, not just my physical health, but my emotional health, my mental health, and having a sense of purpose. And it's called self-care. It's called self-compassion. It's called putting the oxygen mask on myself first. Because if I haven't got the oxygen mask on myself, I can't, I can't have the energy to follow the journey that I'm on. Langley was talking about leadership and leaders. You know what it's like working for leaders that bring energy. You know, I talk about two, two types of individuals out there and leaders. They are the drains who suck every bit of energy out of you every time you interact with them. And then there are the radiators who radiate energy. I'm sure, I'm sure I don't have to ask you who you would prefer to be around and work with. 
Remember that Monday morning when you walk in and you see a drain walking down the corridor. Well, you do an about turn, you suddenly need the toilet. Because by the way, it's Monday morning, you don't really feel like being at work and now you're gonna have a drain. Well, no ways, I'm going to the toilet, I'm gonna find a coffee machine, I'm gonna do something, but I'm just going to not engage with the drain. Versus when you see a radiator walking down the corridor and you wanna engage because maybe they'll give you some of their energy. This was really brought to light again for me in November of this year. I was out on a run because part of what I do every single day is try and keep active. And I was out on a run and I got about two Ks and I kind of felt, oh, I can't, I'm just struggling to breathe. Cut a long story short, on the Wednesday at midnight after that Friday, I was in high care with pulmonary embolisms. Pulmonary embolisms. And the doctor said to me, do you know, I've never seen embolisms this size in both lungs and the person survived. He said, are you fit? I said, very. He said, well, your health and your fitness saved your life. Saved your life. Now I'm going to leave you a little acronym to think about, and then you're going to, we're going to go into some breakouts, but I'm going to leave you with a little acronym, which has become my Bible. It's become my way in which I every single day devote 60 to 90 minutes to attend to all elements of that triangle. And you know, I'm not asking all of you, it's taken me a long time to devote and to, to find the discipline and the wherewithal to put 60 minutes aside every single day for my health. And then people say to me, no ways, I haven't got 60 minutes. And I say, what do you mean you haven't got 60 minutes? There are 24 hours in the day. Are you telling me you can't give yourself one of those to just dedicate to yourself and your own self-care? Are you telling me one out of 24, you can't find that for yourself? You can find it for everybody else. So it's about priorities. It's about that mindset about your own health. And I'm gonna leave you with this little acronym. Now this acronym, unless you have the mindset which says my health is my most important priority, this acronym, this little acronym, you're gonna know, you're gonna know some of this stuff and you're not gonna do it because because your mindset isn't one of the oxygen mask is on me first. And I would urge you in this acronym, if you can't find 60 minutes, try and find 30 as a starter. And if you can't find 30, maybe just try and find 15 a day and build towards that goal of maybe 60 minutes a day where you devote some time to yourself. And let me tell you what the acronym is. The acronym is can do. And the C stands for connect. I find five minutes or 10 minutes every single day to just connect. And why? Because connection, connecting with either nature, with friends, with family, connection is a huge driver of your emotional health. It's a huge driver of emotional health. There's a wonderful book written by Johan Hari. It's called Lost Connections. And he says part of the reason why we are struggling with anxiety and depression in the world today is because we've lost our ability to connect. We've lost our ability to connect to a sense of our own meaning. We've lost our ability to connect to meaningful values. We've lost our ability to connect to nature. We've lost our ability to connect to friends, to family, to community. We've lost our ability to connect to a hopeful view of the future. And it's so ironic that with social media and all these platforms that are out there, we are, even, we are more connected than we've ever been. But I think in terms of meaningful connection, meaningful connection, we've lost it. And so I find five minutes or 10 minutes every single day to just connect. 
the A, the A in can do stands for be active. And I'm not saying you've got to go and now uh, run the London Marathon. But just find 15 minutes every single day or 20 minutes to go and be active. Walk around the block. But find that time to just put some time aside to just be active. And by being active, that contributes to your physical health on my little triangle. The N stands for try and be nice to someone every day. You know what Plato said? Plato said, we are, be kind to everybody that you meet. You know why? Because we're all fighting a harder battle. Be kind to everyone you meet because we are all fighting a harder battle. You know what it, how you feel when you've been nice to somebody. So if I go back to the little framework, nice, being nice to somebody is that sense of purpose, that sense of meaning, that sense of giving to somebody else. I think it was Winston Churchill who said, you earn a life by giving and you earn a living by getting. So you earn a living by getting stuff. But you know what? You earn a life by giving, by being nice to people, having that sense of purpose. The D in can do stands for discover. Learn something new. Be curious. It's such an important driver of your mental health. Continuous learning, discovering something new. And so what do I do? There's some stuff out there that I'm intrigued in. I want to learn more of. And so I find a podcast and I go and stand for 15 minutes a day and I listen to a particular podcast. That's what I do for myself in terms of discover and learning something new. And that's really good for my mental health. It's really good for our mental health. I might do a bit of mindfulness. I'm useless at meditation, but I might do a bit of mindfulness. Five minutes of just being mindful. And finally, the O. The O stands for observe. Observe. Take time out. Remember what I said about recovery. Observe. Can you take five minutes every two hours to just be in observe mode? Completely in the present. And you know what? It is the most difficult part of can do for me is to have five minutes or 10 minutes where I do absolutely nothing. It's difficult. Jeepers. You know why? Because of this thing. Because of this thing. I wonder how many of you, since I've been talking, have not been able to leave it alone. It's just, it's just like, it's just there. And it just, and when I, and when I get, you know, when I try and observe, I think, shit, what, one minute? What, I've got another four to go? Nine more minutes to just do nothing? Wow, it's hard. It's really, really hard. But wow. You know, I used to get on a train of a morning and the first thing that I would do before I've even sat down, I'd like take my phone out and I'd be onto my emails. And do, you know what I do now? Well, not that I've been on a train for a long, long time. But I live in Horsley and I'm going up to Waterloo. I wait for four stations. I wait for Effingham, Cobham, Oxshot and Claygate. And then when I get to Claygate, I pull it out. You can't wait for Claygate to arrive. But for the other four stations, I've just sat there and I've just observed. I've just looked out the window. You know what's so sad? In the carriage, everybody's on something. Everybody is on something. And so taking time out to just observe, to just recover. And you know, maybe with can do, you're going to have five minutes every day where you're going to connect. You're going to have 10 minutes where you're active. You're going to take two minutes to be nice to somebody. You're going to take five minutes to listen to a bit of a podcast to discover. And you're going to have five minutes every two hours. I mean, what's that? 20 minutes, 15 minutes. And so hopefully what I've done up until now, and we're going to go into a few breakouts um, and then we'll come back and, and I'm going to end with a few thoughts on breaking stigma. 
But just a few, hopefully you've got a sense of why am I so passionate about trying to create workplaces all over the world where people feel that they genuinely have the choice to put their hand up and ask for some help. Hopefully I've given you a bit of a sense of what is our well-being made up of? Hopefully I've given you a bit of a sense of, or, or maybe not sense, but maybe I've either confirmed a belief for you about your health, and by confirming that belief and how important it is, you're going to go the extra mile to do some self-care. But also, I might, have, I might have challenged a belief around where your health is in your list of priorities. And in challenging that belief, hopefully you might do something a little different. So why don't I stop there, Langley? And Mari, do you want to put, the, um, put everybody into some breakouts? And, and really what I want you to do in those breakouts is just have a, have a brief conversation around, around what might have resonated for you in what I've said today. And what one thing might you do differently as a result of what you've heard me say up until now? Over to you, Mari. Thanks very much, Jeff. Yeah, Mari's got the lead on that. I think we'll go for, um, if we can squeeze 10 minutes, we will. I'll just have a chat with uh, Jeff and how much time we got left. We may reduce down to five. So uh, over to you, Mari. Thank you. Yes, I've opened the room so people should be able to click join. <clears throat> Welcome back, everybody. Um, hopefully that short, short uh, interlude was uh, useful just to get... Uh, the cognitive juice is flowing. Um, we're going we're gonna to change things up a little bit here. We're going to go straight to uh, Q&A and a discussion se session. So really over to the audience um, to ask what you will of, uh, of Jeff. Um, you can either, uh, if you just stick your hand up on the, uh, 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 on the screen here, or, um, or if you want to either private message or put a, a message into the chat box for everyone, we can, we can pick those up. Um, whilst you're thinking, if I could just um, ask... Uh, Jeff, just do a couple of minutes on, you talked about breaking stigma, and I know we were going to go into that slot. Uh, what if you could just draw on, on some of your experiences and what you've learned, both building on what you spoke about earlier from your own experiences, but what you've learned, uh, learned since. Thanks. Yeah, Langley, I think, I mean, when it comes to breaking stigma, I, you know, I think there's sort of three or four critical success factors um, that an organization needs to be, be prepared to invest in. The first one is education. It's about training every single person in your organization a 90 minutes or a two hour session on mental health. What is depression? What is anxiety? What is stress? What are the symptoms to look out for? You know, how do you have a conversation with somebody who might be struggling? How do you reintegrate somebody? Just some basic, basic training and then do it for everybody, not just a few mental health first aiders, just do it for everybody. It's such a sensitive subject. You know, I'll, you, if I know that you've got a tolerant and compassionate relationship to mental ill health, as my peer, I'll turn and, and talk to you about it. But if I'm not sure about your relationship, I won't. But if we know that everybody's been trained and everybody's probably got a better understanding or more compassionate, that allows for that conversation to take place. So that's the first thing. The second is all about, is about sort of campaigning, communication, awareness building, the language that you want to use, getting that language right. You know, you spoke about mental fitness, you know, maybe that is the language that you want to use rather than mental health or mental ill health, but talking about mental fitness and, and running campaigns and building awareness. The third is, is telling stories, is getting people to share some of their stories. You know, everybody's got a story and, and storytelling is a huge, huge driver. You know, when every, I often say every story that we tell, is like sending a lifeboat out into the ocean. And the billions of people that are suffering in silence, when they hear that story, you know what they do? They cling on to the lifeboat and they realize two things. One, they're not alone. And secondly, they might just be normal. There's nothing wrong with them. Something has just happened to them. They're not alone and they're just normal. That story is a lifeboat. It's a lifeboat to millions and billions of people around the world. So, so education, Awareness building through campaigns, communication, storytelling. And then finally, I think it's really important that if you go down this route, that you make sure you've got the support resources in place. You know, and I know in the army, it's really, really good. You've got, you've got welfare departments, 
And so line managers or, or officers or whoever you are leading who comes in and has that conversation, you know, they're not psychiatrists, they're not therapists, but they need to know where are they going to signpost people to? What are they going to do? Where are they going to signpost them to? And, you know, often the most important thing when somebody comes to you and talks to you about, you know, that they might be struggling, you know, and often we feel, oh, I don't know what to say and I better not say the wrong thing. And sometimes it's just about listening. It's just about listening. You know, I can't always be happy, but I can always appreciate somebody who listens to me. Can't always be happy, but I can always appreciate somebody who just listens. So, so education, storytelling, awareness building through campaigns, which kind of normalizes it and says it's actually okay to talk about this stuff and having those support services, critical drivers or breaking stigma Langley. Jeff, thanks very much. There's, there's definitely a role for us all to play there. Um, I wonder if I can throw it over to John, John O'Neill, who's just put a question in the, uh, in the chat box. John, are you there? Are you willing to, to share that question with the team? No. Oh, so, okay, I, I, I've got a chair, Langley. So the question is, Go for it. Let me, let me, so do you think that annual grading personnel on mental and physical as part of their formal reporting? Um, I, I don't think we should, this is a really good question from John. Um, you know, John, I, I think that we should, I think we should, I think we should create a mindset in all organizations around performance, all right? Where performance is not just about knowledge, skills, and behaviors and experience. So if you think about the performance management equation, you know, we often, we often develop all of our processes and systems and everything around performance against that equation, where we say, in order for somebody to perform, they've got to have the knowledge to do the job, they've got to have the skills to do the job, they've got to have the right behaviors, and they've got to have the right experience. All right? So I'm not going to make you a lieutenant colonel if you haven't had some experience as being a major or whatever the case might be. Now, what I think is, I think we should include in that equation, we should multiply the whole equation by health, by energy. Because if energy and health is zero, performance is zero. You can have all the knowledge, all the skills, all the behaviors, all the experience, but if you're unhealthy, you can't perform. But I don't think we should then assess people's performance based on their health. But what I do think we should do is we should offer people the opportunity and we should not just have a skill development plan for people or a knowledge development plan where they're going to go on a course and learn how to do combat or whatever. I think we should also have ensure that people have well-being plans as part of their development. So every single person in the army as part of their development should be a well-being plan. And, and, and in order to make that happen, the army better make sure they've got the resources or the Navy or, you know, the Air Force, but have they got the resources in place that people can draw on to maintain good physical, emotional, mental, and that sense of purpose and meaning. And I think we should be teaching in leadership development, in leadership development, Langley, why aren't we teaching leaders how to look after their well-being? I mean, it, it's not part of leadership development curricula that we do a session around well-being and how do you maintain good physical health, emotional health, mental health, helping them think about their sense of purpose and meaning so that they can be, be leaders that are gonna bring energy to where they are leading. And so I see it more as a development opportunity rather than a grading and a, an assessment around what I would like people to do is to be able to have a conversation with their boss using that little triangle which says, on a scale of one to five, I'm a two physically, I'm a three emotionally, I'm a two mentally, and I'm a one in terms of purpose. And then have a conversation around, okay, so what are you gonna do to get to a five? And what is your development plan gonna look like? But I never ever want us to assess people and measure them against their mental and emotional health. And if they don't measure up, then I fire them. No ways. I want to rather go down the development route and ensure that we have development plans as part of their development, as part of your growth as a leader in the, in the army. You know what? 
you are going to learn about well-being. You know, all over the world, when I talk to senior people and I talk to individuals and I say to them, come on, what are the drivers of well-being? They all tell me physical. They don't know anything about emotional health, how to look after their mental health, sense of purpose and meaning. It's never been part of the curriculum or taught. And I think we need to bring that into, into the development, the development ethos in workplaces. So, John, I hope that's answered your question. Jeff, thanks very much for that. I'm, I'm going to bring in um, Colette in a minute just to expand on a comment she made. Um, and then uh, and potentially if I can ask Mark Kaiser if, um, if you'll be willing to ask your question. And, and, and at the end, Jeff, I'll come back if I can just steal two minutes off you right at the end. I've got one slide to show the work that the Army um, Health uh, team are doing to, to, to look at exactly these issues and, um, and, and see how we're developing as an organization to touch on some of your points, but yeah, absolutely valid points about looking after and developing our individuals. Can, couldn't agree more. Um, Colette, do you want to just come on and um, expand on your point, please? Thank you. Thank you. Um, I've been working at the Defence Academy for the last seven years, and before that, I always worked in civilian environments. And what I've seen is that there is a tension between um, the expectation of mental resilience and the fear of mental illness. And I know great strides have been made in terms of PTSD, but I still think that there's a change of culture that's required. Um, I mainly see the army, so um, talking about the army mainly, um, that mental illness is still seen as weakness. And I do hear very um, disparaging language about it. It's extremely difficult for people to own up to it. And I would also say that, um, I mean, this is not our problem, of course, but because I deal with international students <clears throat> of all ranks, it's very interesting to see <clears throat> the attitudes towards mental health that you see in military forces in, in other countries, which some of you will have had experience of, I know. Um, and so in some senses, we're way ahead because I do think these things are being addressed. Whereas in other countries, it's just not done at all. So yes, change of culture, that this organization is different because of the expectations put on military personnel. Yeah, Colette, I'm not sure that it's that different. Um, you know, I go into a Lloyds Bank or an HSBC and people are absolutely fearful about talking about <coughs> mental ill health because they think that'll be the end of their career. A CEO, I mean, I spend years trying to get CEOs to talk about and tell their stories and they're fearful of doing it because the board's going to fire them because they think that they haven't got the wherewithal to be able to run the organization because they suffered from depression. Well, guess what? The guy from Lloyds came out and look at the amazing work that he's now done around mental health in Lloyds. And, and so I, I think that this is, and I'm 100% with you about, you know, different cultures, um, you know, parts of the world where there's no ways you can talk about this sort of stuff. And that's where I come back to the thing around education, education and storytelling. You know, the more we can, I mean, I wonder how much, how much has the, has, has the army actually invested in training every single person around this concept of mental health? What is depression? What is anxiety? What is stress? What are the symptoms? It's about normalizing it. It's about, it's about educating people because for, for as long as we are uneducated about this, then there's, we just fill that vacuum with stigma. And I think the more we can tell stories and the more we can get really senior personnel in the army to share a bit of their stories and, you know, then, then it, it kind of starts to normalize this stuff. And it's actually, and in many ways, COVID-19 has democratized mental ill health. I mean, I'm now having conversations in countries that I could never get into, but suddenly people are saying, you know what, this stuff is real, you know, this is real and we need to talk about it. Thanks, Jeff. I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. Colette, I think you hit the nail on the head there in terms of, of, of culture. It's a really, really important issue. Um, and I think at your point about the differences between the British Army and other armies, obviously we're a reflection of society as well. And I think Patrick mentioned in his comment here about the British stiff upper lip. I think, you know, as a, as a, as a society, Britain has had this 
difficulty with talking about these sort of issues and that's changing society's changing and if i can give a very quick personal view having been in the army for 20 plus years i think we are moving positively in the right direction and open up beyond just you know ptsd and the real extreme ends but you know day-to-day -day mental resilience um dealing with stress uh, etc and i think i think we are we are definitely improving as an organization but but, but i don't doubt that we've got we've still got a way to go um, but this is exactly what today is all about as part of that journey. Um, Mark, are you, uh, thank you, Kira. Mark, are you here? Are you with us? Are you able to uh, present your question to, to Jeff? Uh, yes, thank you. I'm sorry, I'm having issues with, because I'm on the move today, so I'm, I'm not on camera. Um, my question uh, regards, um, is there any straightforward advice on how to deal with leadership figures who immediately recoil at the mention of mental health? So I'm sort of thinking, obviously, senior figures, which is, makes things a bit awkward to deal with and often just because doctrine suggests that we now have to deal with mental health or this is a good thing um, not everybody's enthusiastic about it and I think there's there's nothing worse than when you sort of have people who say um, oh here we go we have to deal with this blah 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 um, so yeah is there any straightforward advice on this sorry I'm looking who, who's asking this question where are you Mark Sorry, I haven't got my camera on. So, oh, it's um, Mark Kaiser. Oh, is that you? Yes. Okay, Mark. That is me there, yes. That's yeah, thinking. cool. Thanks, Mark. Yeah, you know what? I mean, I, I think what you've got to do with these... Um, I mean, I, I, I think it's about exposing those really senior people, you know, to individuals um, that they would respect who come and tell their story. Um, you know, um, I don't know, there's a world heavyweight boxer who suffers from depression. Um, you know, do you get him in the room and to share his story and to talk about it? Um, I mean, I don't know how Alistair Campbell goes down in, in, in the army, but, um, you know, but are there some, some, some really influential people that they kind of, you know, would respect and kind of think sheepers what really you and by the way have then continued and gone on to make quite a success of their life um you know do you do you talk about some leading figures that this world could not have done without like winston churchill who was a depressor who struggled from depression you know i often i mean somebody once said to me mark they said they said to me i, I was i was being interviewed by cnbc and um at the end of the interview, the, the, the journalist, he asked me a question and he said, he said, Jeff, why on earth would you ever recruit somebody who had suffered from depression or anxiety in the past versus somebody who's never suffered, all right? Why would you ever, ever recruit that person who might have suffered? And you know what I said to them? I said, you know, I, 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 I might recruit the person who has suffered in the past. I'll tell you why. That person is probably a better listener. That person is probably more compassionate. That person is probably uh, very in tune with the symptoms around depression and anxiety and has the language and can talk about this stuff. Do you know what? That person has overcome a significant challenge in their life. Significant, significant challenge and got better. Do you know what? That person's probably a better human being as a result of what they've been through. And you know what? I would love to see more human beings leading organizations today than some of the narcissists that lead organizations and countries today. So bring it on, bring it on. So how do we find a way of almost making heroes out of some of those people who've suffered in the past and putting those cases, those live examples in front of some of these people going forward? Mark? Any comments, Mark? Sorry, I had the microphone off. Um, yes, no, thank you for that. No, that, that is, that is, that's, that's really interesting. I mean, the, is, again, I, I, the point you're making is what, uh, I suppose it refers to what you were saying earlier about campaigning. So I suppose even when we're, we are dealing with senior figures, it, um, it will have to be, we're constantly putting this point across that this really is important um, rather than sort of just ignoring it and sort of saying, okay, this person yeah. isn't on the same wavelength. Um, you know i'll just i'll just agree with them simply because either they're more senior to myself or yeah or they just just haven't got an interest in it 
But you know, Mark, I think also just getting the external catalyst in, getting the external person to come in and who, who these guys are going to, you know, they're going to kind of respect because of, you know, what they've either done in business or in whatever. And, and letting those individuals just share and tell their stories. You know, I've had instances where I've done this with executive teams. And then I kind of expect at the end of my talk, because I've just done it with the board, that the CEO is going to call the PA and walk me out. And instead what happens is the CEO walks me out and says, Jeepers, you know what? I'm now going to go and do something about myself. I'm going to start this conversation. You know what? You've, you've made me realize that this is, actually, this is actually okay to be able to have this conversation, to talk about this stuff. And by the way, you know, it's not as if you know, my whole career came to an end as a result of it. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I, I think there, there's, there's something around that kind of external catalyst and just putting in front of some of these hardcore alpha male types, um, you know, people that are a bit like them, but who've suffered. Mark, thank you very much. And yeah, thank, thank you very much for that. Thank you. I'm conscious of, uh, of time, Jeff, we're right up against it. So if I, if I may steal, as I say, two minutes just to share a screen with everyone, um, that hopefully you'll be able to see in a minute. Can you all see that? Great, uh, two seconds. So this is the, uh, the Army's approach. Uh, touching on some of your points just now, Jeff, um, I won't go into detail on it, but the Army Health Branch have done a lot of work over the last number of uh, the months uh, and recent years to provide the resources we need to, uh, to get after our mental uh, well-being and our resilience under the program OpSmart, and most of the military folk here will no doubt have heard about optimizing performance through stress management and resilience training. Um, above the line there, you can see the mental resilience training uh, booklet. If, for those of you who haven't seen that, it's really worth getting hold of that, talking about setting goals, thinking positive, emotional control, anxiety regulation, and mental rehearsal, and a number of the issues that Jeff and techniques Je Jeff talked about today are, are covered there. And there's also um, 12 work strands that they are, are developing that looks, looks to put our mental resilience and our mental fitness at the heart of our uh, heart of our work, heart of our training, our pre-deployment training, but also our leadership development. And, um, and you, you specifically talked about that. Um, and the, one of the boxes you say down there, Army Leadership Development Program, ALDP, um, we, we're putting mental health in there. And we here at the Central Army Leadership do a lot of work with the Army Health Branch. We have sort of reignited that relationship to, uh, to, 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 to tie those ends up. Um, and as you see on the model on the left-hand side, you know, leadership is the wrap around uh, these issues. Um, and and bringing it back to, to, to leadership, we've talked a lot today quite rightly about the individual um, and the importance of looking after each other and looking after ourselves as, um, uh, as individuals. And as I said right at the beginning, you know, if, if you're going to be a good leader, then you need to have good mental fitness, resilience, uh, good health. But it's also up to the leader, as you know, Colette mentioned it there, it's up to the leader to um, shape the culture and which shapes the, sorry, shape the climate, which shapes the culture, which enables people to talk. You, you know, you, you talked, Jeff, about that climate where people have the opportunity to share, the opportunity to, to, to talk. It's the leader that brings and can regulate that energy amongst the team. Um, so, uh, you know, I think we've all got a role. And this is not just leaders in management positions, positions of authority. This is, this is everyone. So it's really, really important stuff. Um, I won't go into any more detail on that. Suffice to say, Jeff, um, it's the second time I've heard you, you talk now. And, um, and it does get better each time. And, um, and you, uh, that, that quote you said right at, the, right at the beginning, Mark Twain's quote, you know, the, the, the day you're born and the, and the day you find out why. I mean, and you, you live and breathe that, that quote. I mean, you, you bring your passion, your purpose, um, and your energy to bear. And, and it's great to see the work you're doing. Thank you so much for spending the time with us today. And, and what I love about it, you wrap it all in humility. One of the greatest gifts that... Uh, people can have so thank you so much for sharing your time with us today and uh, and thank you to you all for joining us um, jeff everyone very best of luck oh, final comments from you jeff no no just a, a very big thank you uh, for giving you the, the platform today to to live out my purpose so thank you for that langley and uh and i wish you everything of the best going forward as you as you as an individual also lead for this issue within the armed services so thank you
Thank you, Jeff. Take care. Bye now.